One of the strategic objectives of the Commission is to make sure that the European Union is a global player in the world. And welcome to Slaterpod. Today we're very happy to have Genoveva Ruiz Calavera join us today. So Genoveva is the head of the Directorate General, General for Interpretation at the European Commission. Genoveva, where does this podcast find you today in Europe? Good morning. I'm in Brussels. I'm in my office, as you see, by the European flag behind. Uh, but I will be moving towards Salzburg uh, tomorrow because we're having a big uh, EU global conference uh, we are organizing under the auspices of Commissioner Han. Got it, got it. So first, tell us a bit about your career before you joined uh, the Director General, because you've been uh, with them for now a year, and then kind of what attracted you to that role uh, in the interpreting side in particular? Thank you, Florian. You know, I have now a career of uh, almost that already 30 years in the European Commission in, in very different uh, positions, but very much in the external uh, domain. Uh, the Commission is, is a, a very attractive employer where you can do a lot of interesting things. And I have developed my careers starting in 1992, uh, working in the implementation of, of the customs union when we established an internal market inside the, the European Union, because I was coming from, from the industry and I came, you you know, with the with the knowledge of uh, the economic operators, what need way that what they needed to ensure the free circulation of goods, people, uh, services, and capitals. Uh, and very soon, I moved into preparing the first accessions, the new accessions to the European Union. And I, I work in the negotiations of Sweden, uh, Finland, Austria, the countries that joined in 1995. I work as well in the negotiations with the Baltic countries and Eastern uh, European countries, uh, Malta and Cyprus, that joined us in 2004. I did uh, monitor embargoes in the context of the wars in the Western Balkans uh, of, 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 uh, in order to stop uh, the, the wars in the 90s. And now I was detached to Pristina in Kosovo after the conflict in 1999. Um, so I have had a lot of uh, career in the external dimension. From there, coming back into the European Commission, I was responsible for the units that were dealing with uh, crisis response and peace building across the world. And uh, I, of course, um, was very glad to be part of the initiation of the European External Action Service and the Foreign Policy Instrument Service that was created in order to enhance uh, the, the EU's role uh, in, in the international scene. Um, in in uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, sorry, in 2016, I was appointed director for the Western Balkans and I, I went back into working in this region, which is very dear to, to my heart. Of course, uh, preparing enlargement negotiations and working in the EU relations to this uh, region, you know, with Albania, with Bosnia Herzegovina, with uh, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia, and, and with Serbia. Um, after five years, you know, I, I decided I wanted to do something different, and I, I am a linguistic by training. And across the board, in all my uh, career, I have felt how important it was communicating in the, in the languages uh, of, of our interlocutors, how important was the role of the interpreters in helping us in this uh, engaging and creating uh, confidence building and, and creating conditions for, for a meaningful uh, dialogue. And um, so I, when uh, the position was vacant, I was very interested to, to, to see if I could uh, access to this important position. And I'm very honored that I have been taken on board. And uh, these first years in the, in the DG has been uh, extremely, is passionating and extremely fast. It looked like it was yesterday when I came uh, to be at the helm of the service. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about some of the challenges uh, later on in the podcast. But first, tell us a bit more about the structure of the Directorate General, kind of its size, maybe reporting lines. Where does it sit in the broader uh, commission um, uh, structure? Thanks. Uh, look, we have uh, our Directorate General is part of the of the services, uh, which are in a way, you know, back office services supporting uh, policy DGs. And um, it is a, a, a very important service that has played in a fantastic role during the COVID pandemic because we are working, our, our mission is articulated in three main areas. 
Of course, the first one is we facilitate the EU's democratic decision-making process by providing high-quality conference interpretation uh, to all the EU institutions except the Parliament and the Court of Justice. So we are working with the Commission, we're working with the Council, with the Committee of the Regions, uh, with the Economic and Social Committee, with the EU agencies like Europol, the European Investment Bank, etc. And um, we have certainly an interpretation we deliver in 24 EU languages, the official languages of the EU, but as well in a considerable number of non-EU languages, because every time we have our ministers uh, talking to our third uh, partners around the world, of course, uh, we represent as well, we, we, we provide those services. We are always, we are on the second strand of our work is we are providing corporate cor uh, conference organization, like the organization that we are now uh, preparing this high level conference in Salzburg is organized by SKIC as well. And then we have as well, a very important role, much less known outside the house, which is uh, uh, conference room management on behalf of the commission. I mean, we have right now, we're responsible for 600 meeting rooms in the commission, and by the end of the mandate of this commission, we'll be responsible for, for uh, 1,000 of these meeting rooms. And you have to realize that the Commission is moving into new collaborative work, uh, ways of working with open space. And, you know, this, uh, to be able to have these infrastructures is extremely important for the Commission to, to uh, as a whole, to continue delivering this mandate. We work un under the auspices of Commissioner Han, who is the commissioner responsible for budget and, 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 and human resources administration. He has several services under him. He reports directly to President von der Leyen. Of course, he's a member of the College of the European Commission. You mentioned SKIC. So is that the way you refer to it internally? Internally, we call it, it's the, it's the French uh, acronym, you know, Le Service Commande Interpretation de Conference. I mean, this is a service which is like a family and people have been working uh, with uh, with the, this director in general, which officially we are called Director General Interpretation for many years. So inside the house, we're still, you know, the heart of, of, of the people that work in this service, uh, they still call it a skick and I'm very happy to embrace that. <laughs> Did you know this is kind of the internal lingo before you joined or was this like something day one? This is something that our, uh, the staff of, of, of uh, the interpretation has always uh, referred to themselves uh, as a skik. So, I mean, I like the acronym, but I do. Uh, thanks a lot for referring to it because we have to be careful when we're talking with uh, people outside to be much more clear than what does it mean. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, so you've been in the role, as you said, now for over a year. What, what were kind of the top two, three challenges since you, uh, since you started? Look, the first challenge that when I started, you can imagine, was, you know, to be starting at the helm of a service, which is big. I mean, we, we are oh, um, around 800, you know, staff inside the, divided in three directorates. And then we have, we work with around 2,900, you know, of our external colleagues. And uh, to start in this, in this uh, capacity in the middle of the pandemics, you know, COVID has been extremely disruptive for, for the interpretation community, as you can imagine. And, and it has been certainly very stressing times for our uh, interpreters for two reasons, because we had to to protect them and, and establish, you know, all necessary measures for social distances, which of course included the, the installation of plexiglass partitions in the booths that didn't allow the, them to work in their normal conditions. They could only work two instead of three. We had as well a drop, a dramatic drop in demand of, 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 of interpretation services, which affected extremely our colleagues, external colleagues, because there was no jobs, <laughs> no business uh, going. And we had to develop in, in, in in a very short time frame, um, new tools, uh, video conferencing, uh, tools that would allow interpretation as well. Because, and that was, uh, I mean, it, it has been uh, revolutionary. We certainly, these interpretation platforms have helped us to provide services during this crisis. But of course, it has forced us all to, to be very attentive to the impact of that technology as well, because the sound has not yet uh, uh, been uh, fully mastered. There's a lot of dimensions of that sound, which includes not only the technicalities of, of the platforms and the connections, but as well the etiquette of the participants in those, uh, in those meetings on remote basis. And, um, 
and you know our interpreters need very good uh, sound quality to be able to listen and speak at the same time and, and to be able to deliver the high level uh, interpretation, the quality that they are uh, accustomed. So that has been a very important challenge to, to live through these uh, difficult times and, and, and constantly uh, requiring adapting our modus operandi to the evolution of the pandemics. <laughs> so we had several lockdowns coming back, coming back, uh, back and forth. And, um, and I'm very happy that my first year has been really investing in creating, you know, a, a very close dialogue with our customers from the different institutions to identify where the future is going. Because we have learned a lot of things as well from this, from this crisis. And we have seen that there were new and different needs emerging as well. Uh, I'm very happy in any case that uh, we are seeing the end of the pandemic. We are started restoring gradually as of 1st of May now in Ski, the, the full commission has started to, to get out of the business continuity mode 1st of April. We have taken one month more for this service to, to adapt and it's going to be uh, gradual, but we're going back towards uh, Towards this new normal, which will allow us to be back into the meeting rooms more in presence, but at the same time to, to, to take advantage of the new technologies, because we, we see that some of the meetings will continue to be not now, not fully virtual, but hybrid. And this is an area where we have to continue uh, investing. I, I have to say that my colleagues have been extremely resilient and, 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 and I, I am very pleased because we have reached now comparable levels of, of interpretation to the pre-COVID times, among other reasons, thanks to a very active uh, French presidency we, and because of the international context, which uh, is, is forcing all of us in the European Union to work uh, 24 hours, seven days a week uh, in order to respond to the challenges that are uh, right now in front of us. That is interesting. Yeah. So that, uh, so you're saying it, it also, the, a, a particular country's presidency kind of influences demand on your side as well. And like just the general, obviously kind of macro picture. It does. It does. I think this presidency has been extremely useful in this respect, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, of course our, our, uh, French administration wanted to ensure that multilingualism was preserved, but not only because the, the, the agenda they have had on the table has been very busy and they have certainly been extremely, uh, proactive in recreating conditions for, for the meetings of the council and the other institutions to take place as, as soon as possible within, you know, with, within the constraints that we had because of the pandemics, but certainly very committed to go back towards normality. You mentioned the external colleagues, like, I think it's called auxiliary conference interpreters. Like, how do you work with them? Uh, how, how, like, when would you engage with them and when not? Like, can you just tell us a bit more about that? Look, our, our, um, we call them freelancers. Our our auxiliary con uh, conference interpreters are is, are part of our business model, and they are certainly very uh, well integrated in 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 the way we do business. I mean, we have. Um, I, I will do my best. Uh, there has been a strong partnership uh, with AIC, the Association of uh, uh, Freelance Interpreters, and I am committed to, to nurture this uh, very strong relationship. You know, but we have had two difficult and uh, years, very uncertain, uh, which uh, which have really have a very uh, strong toll on, on this community. I am now more optimistic, uh, looking towards the future because of the pickup of the, of the demand. You know, um, they are clearly part of our business model and will continue to be part of our business model. Um, we have a, a need in order to be able to deliver the 24 languages that we deliver in the European Union to make, uh, you know, to have a strong uh, relationship with them. And we have as well, you know, a, a, a lot of uh, uh, non-EU languages, which we are heavily depending on our freelance community. Now, you mentioned just generally remote. How, how does remote influence the training and recruiting maybe? And are you using any kind of, are there any new ways of recruiting and accreditation, accrediting certain interpreters maybe? Yeah, we are, uh, you know, we are in a process, we are piloting technology across the board. Huh? And this is, for instance, one of the reasons uh, uh, for, uh, Let's put it like this. I mean, we have learned lessons from this COVID crisis that there are other ways to do things, not only the traditional ways we had. And these ways can be uh, more useful 
for, for all of us as, a, as administrations, uh, which have to deliver public goods because the interpretation in the EU 24 language is a public good that uh, my director general delivers on behalf of all the EU citizens and the decision-making process uh, of the European Union. And um, in delivering those public goods, you have to realize that our administration as well is bound by the objective, the overall political objective of this commission. And uh, as you realize, there's two overriding uh, political objectives of this commission, which is the dual uh, green and, uh, and digital transitions to be applied to the European Union economies and to the way uh, the public uh, service that, that does business. I think that reflection has been put into test clearly during COVID. I mean, from one day to the next, we had to take our computers and go home. And 80% and of, of the staff of the commission had to be working on the remote basis. I think this, this has uh, helped us to realize that if we wanted to continue delivering business, we had to move uh, many things remote. That has been the case of training. You know, our pedagogical assistance and a lo lot of the training schemes that we had, we managed to continue them on a remote basis through uh, our platforms. We have certainly realized that, uh, I mean, it's not uh, totally fit for all the sort of assistance and training that we want to do, but that there's a lot of training that we can be more inclusive and have much larger audience and outreach if we can do it remote. So we have had really um, an opportunity to, during these two years, to develop our, our remote uh, uh, training models and activities and, 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 and working practices. But uh, there are, of course, trainings that will go back to be in person as well. Uh, for the accreditation, this is in a very interesting area as well where we are uh, working together in, uh, because uh, accreditation of new interpreters, uh, uh, we have a model which is an interinstitutional accreditation test uh, for freelancers interpreters. And we are now working together with the other institutions, with the Parliament and the Court of Justice, um, on a new pilot uh, procedure to um, use uh, different platforms to accredit it, uh, to do the accreditation test. Uh, we have done several uh, series of, of uh, pilot testing this year. We want to continue extending this pilot uh, in order to look into all the things we can learn and we can benefit from, from these new tools. You know, our objective is to increase the number of, of people in our accredited list. And, uh, and, and this remote uh, type of testing allows us to be able to organize more than one test a year. So that's why there are benefits. We want, of course, that the process is, uh, is, is uh, sound from the point of view of the quality, from the point of view of the legality, and from the point of view, of course, the delivery of the output. And that's why this, we are piloting with the other institutions. But I'm, I'm very optimistic that this has, uh, these are areas that we, we will continue developing because they are in our interest, in the interest of the institutions, but in the interest as well of, of, of the interpreters as a whole. Let's change topic. Let's talk about the use of English in the European Union and Commission maybe specifically. Like, how does the use of English, how has it changed as maybe a lingua franca or not since, since Brexit? Look, I mean, English remains uh, one of the 24 uh, EU languages, even despite uh, something which I personally regret a lot, the departure from, from UK, from the European Union. I mean, someone like me that have been working 30 years to, to, big, uh, to, to make uh, the, the EU stronger and bigger, and, and I've been working on, on all the different successive enlargement waves. I mean, it was a moment of, of, of real uh, sad uh, uh, to see the... But it's a decision we respect. It's a decision of the, the people of the UK. And, and, and this doesn't mean that the English is no longer here. English is here to stay. We have two EU member states uh, in which English is the official language, Ireland and Malta. And we see as well English is still a very important relay language, in particular for the countries that uh, came from the EU enlargement of 20, 2004. So... Um, we, we are a service that we uh, respond to demand and the demand continues uh, to be there uh, for, for English. And I want to now take this opportunity to pay tribute that we have, you know, the new member states that joined in 2004. We have already a first generation of, of young people from those member states that have become uh, to the voting age. They are 18 years old uh, this year and just on the 1st of May. And really shows that, uh, I mean, our, our um, multilingualism is here to stay. We have new generations uh, that are now EU citizens and, and uh, English is part as well of the languages they speak.
Got it. Um, I recently picked up an initiative you're running called Be Heard, a Be Heard campaign. Tell us more about that. I am extremely happy that our colleagues, we work in a very close cooperation interinstitutionally. And, you know, this is the campaign of the European Parliament. You know, they are giving us this QR code uh, so that everybody can access. And it's, of course, fully supported by, by, by me, the European Commission, because, you know, technology has been is now a very big part of the way we do business. And um, we are all struggling with the same issues related to sound. I mean, it is very important to that uh, our, um, the users that uh, connect uh, on remote basis to our meetings understand that, uh, you know, their, their, their objective of their connection is that their message pass. And in order for the message pass, the sound has to be correct so that uh, the, the message can be loud and clear for the people uh, participating in those meetings and for the interpreters that need to interpret that message. In the... It is a very topical issue at the moment. We are really joining forces to really look into how can we make, you know, improve the connections, improve the platforms, improve, improve the peripherals. Uh, but... Uh, a very important part of this campaign is how do we increase the, the awareness of the people that connect about, I would say, the etiquette, because, you know, we need to have this meeting etiquette that you shouldn't connect from the outside in a car, in the middle of, uh, of the road, in a train, that you, you have to have the proper, you know, if you are not in your office, you, ha you have to be in a room with the right light, with the right, uh, you know, isolation and with the right conditions. And this is a, a matter of, of ensuring that, uh, that uh, the, the, not only the meeting goes well, but that the, the work of our interpreters can continue to be delivered in the best possible conditions to provide quality interpretation. And of course, um, this requires a lot of awareness. There's many people that are still not understanding the, 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 the liability that it is for them as well and for their prestige and their reputation to come across in such a bad, uh, unprofessional manner. And this is part of the efforts that we are doing in all the institutions to increase within our institutions and with our partners outside uh, this awareness. And this is something which we are sharing all our campaigns with international partners like the UN and some other important, you know, players in the interpretation world to make sure that we join forces. And uh, I'm very happy that the European Parliament um, is now extremely active and, 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 and providing that sort of backbone that we are as well following in the Commission with our own means. It's fascinating that we have had two years to get our background game up, to get a somewhat isolated environment for uh, for high quality uh, audio, right? Uh, sometimes, yeah, so I'm also surprised when people take calls like from a car and like, you know, with a shaky mobile phone. It requires a change of culture and we, we, we will continue investing in this. So you mentioned before that you're also working with non-European Union languages, non-European Union countries. So so how does this work? How does it fit with your uh, with your objectives? For us, you know, we are, uh, you know, one of the strategic objectives of the Commission is to make sure that the European Union is a global player in the world. And that means that, you know, uh, the work of the European Union has two dimensions, an internal dimension with our member states, but a very strong external dimension of partnership with all the in our international partners. And that, of course, requires that we work um, a lot in EU no not languages when we have, you know, bilateral summits and, and all sorts of engagements at all different political levels. Uh, we provide interpretation in those new uh, non-EU languages in, Ch in Chinese, in Turkish, in Arabic, in Japanese, in, you know, right now, of course, Ukrainian, as you, as you can imagine, uh, to name a few. But we have as well a lot of uh, pedagogical assistance uh, in the third, in third countries that are extremely politically important. Just to give you an example, you know, in the context of the ASEM, the Asia uh, Summit uh, um, that, that was hosted in Mongolia a few years ago, we help them train interpreters so that they can good host this big international event. And these interpreters are now regularly working for our EU delegation in Ulaanbaatar. So yes, it fits very much into our EU objectives. And there is a, this is an area as well where we are uh, working very closely together with our freelance community. Now, you mentioned the war in Ukraine, of course, a topic that uh, has kind of a momentous shift in, in the European uh, landscape in general right so so how have uh, have you have the your interpreting service how have you been involved in maybe supporting refugees from ukraine i mean there's millions and millions you know coming across the border in countries like poland and now coming further west uh, can you just elaborate on on your role there 
Thanks, uh, Florian, for giving me the opportunity to start with a much more generic, uh, you know, global statement. I want to say, you know, the EU stands by Ukraine in the face of this uh, unjustified uh, aggression by Russia. And, and certainly all across the board in the EU institutions were working to do as much as possible to, to stop this war. And we stand behind the people of, of Ukraine that are really being so courageous in, in defending the values of democracy they are defending right now. Um, we, across the board in the Commission, we have a very active <laughs> moment. You know, we have been already putting on the five packages of sanctions on, on, the, on the floor. You can imagine that, that this is an enormous amount of work in which the interpreters have a very important role because in order to adapt, those, those packages have to be adopted by unanimity of our women member states, so requiring an enormous amount of, of meetings at all levels of, of our institutions to get there. Uh, but at personal level as well, I mean, in addition to our work right now to support the EU decision-making process, uh, we have a lot of initiatives at individual level of our of our uh, interpreters and, and staff from SKIC. We are, you know, our colleagues are hosting refugees. We are donating funds. They are very active in volunteering activities. We have helped the commission as a whole because the, we, the commission has right now a very active volunteering program to support uh, the, the hosting of these refugees. Um, so we have helped in developing as well uh, the, um, some, some tips uh, to help community interpretation, because there's a lot of people right now that have to accompany those refugees to, to the community, to the to get the register. And we have developed those interpretation tips at the use of all our commission uh, colleagues. And, and we have uh, offered our services in order to be able to support any initiative that the Commission has uh, to take in, in response to this crisis. So I am extremely, uh, it's, it's very rewarding for me to see the level of solidarity that my colleagues in SKIC are, are demonstrating, not only as a service, but as well as individuals. Absolutely. So um, thanks for that. So for, for the future, uh, just the, your top one, two, three initiatives for the, for the next couple of years at, uh, at SKIC. Look, I mean, we have to continue preparing this, this service for the future. And I always uh, tell my uh, colleagues that uh, the only thing we know about the future, uh, the only cert certainty we have about the future is that the future is uncertain. So we have to, I mean, we have seen all these uh, latest crises, uh, we have seen the pandemics. So the future is uncertain. And I think the service has to be ready to respond to whatever the future uh, uh, brings. And that uh, really is my first priority, to continue preparing us to be able to, to be there all the, every time our services are required. You know, and uh, this requires, you know, a lot of creativity because the first thing that preoccupies me is that we deliver our uh, high quality uh, interpretation. And this is uh, something I want to maintain as a, is, is a, the brand of our service. I want as well to uh, do that, the ski continues to be a center of excellence uh, in everything we relates to interpretation, but as well to meeting organization and conference management, which are the two other strands of our work. And there's a lot of opportunities for, for cross-fertilization uh, of these three strands. And um, certainly our biggest challenge in, in, is to, to maintain, you know, the, the, the motivation, the assets we have, which is our people, uh, and to embrace new technologies at the services of our people and our customers. So I, I think in the two years we have confronted COVID, we have demonstrated that our staff is resilient and that our ways of working are resilient and that we are capable of adapting to new challenges. And this is certainly makes me optimistic that uh, the plans that we have for the future uh, of SKIC are realistic as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today, Genoveva. It was a pleasure having you on the, on the podcast. Thank you, Floria, for inviting me to be with all of you. Have a very nice day.